Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, wherever you're watching us from. We're so glad to have you joining us today. My name is Justin Vibbert, and I'm co-moderating with Elizabeth Nowland for today's live session. And we're very excited to bring you a thorough panel discussion on streaming classical music in the United States. This event is hosted by the Major Orchestra Librarians Association. MOLA is a professional organization for performance librarians and consists of a variety of member organizations from around the world. So thank you for joining us. Today also kicks off our virtual conference and we invite our viewers and members to go to our website for more information on upcoming sessions and resources that will be happening and we'll be uploading over the coming uh, weeks and months. You can also follow hashtag virtual MOLA for the latest information on that. As I mentioned before, I will be co-moderating. I am the principal librarian for the Sarasota Orchestra, let me say that. And I'm co-moderating with Elizabeth Nowland, who is performance librarian for the University of Michigan uh, Music Theater and Dance, School of Music Theater and Dance. So with that, let's go ahead and meet our panel. First, we have uh, Jay Berger, who is coming to us from the Carl Fisher and Theodore Presser Company. Uh, nice to be here. We also have Karen Heyman, who is production manager at Pure Music Classical. Hello. We have Kevin McGee, who's manager of digital and mechanical licensing at Wise Music Group. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. We have Staff Sergeant Charles Paul, who is Assistant Chief Librarian for the United States Marine Band, and I should add has also been a member of our work group that has put together this project, just for full disclosure. Hello. Thanks for putting this together, guys. It's been it's great. Norman Ryan is joining us. He's Vice President of Composers and Repertoire for Shot Music Corporation and European American Music. Thanks, everyone. Good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Jim Schneeberg is joining us as uh, he's general manager from Kaiser Southern uh, Music Company, where he handles rentals, production, composer relations, and more. Thank you so much for the uh, invitation. And Eric Wendell is with us today, who is director of rental and grand rights licensing for Boozy and Hawks Incorporated. Good afternoon, all. Happy to be here. We're also very pleased to have with us uh, Jim Kendrick, who is a partner in Alter Kendrick and Barron LLP. He's also counsel to the Music Publishers Association and a board member for ASCAP. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jim, who would like to make a few words. Thank you very much, uh, Justin. And uh, thanks very much to MOLA for organizing this panel. Um, I'll be very quick. As counsel to the Music Publishers Association, I need to say a brief word about an important legal point uh, that uh, affects the, the participation of the publishers on the panel today. Music publishers are independent for-profit businesses that compete for performances and for other uses of their works. As such, they are forbidden by the antitrust laws from discussing prices, terms, and conditions either amongst themselves or taking common positions on such matters. The discussions today, therefore, must be limited to the legal principles and the general business practices applicable to streaming in the U.S. If you have questions about the fees or business practices of a particular publisher, please contact that publisher directly. Thanks very much. Thank you for that, Jim. Yes, very good advice and um, just a good reminder for all of us to keep that today. So back to our viewers, we also want to uh, remind you all that, of course, not you're watching us on one of our social media streams. And we would like to welcome your comments and your engagement today uh, on any of our social media platforms. These are some of the hashtags that we have active for that. And we encourage you to use them or follow them to be part of the conversation. We'd also recommend that you go to our, um, you go to our website and uh, there you can click on the education link at the top of the homepage and you will find an FAQ page with terminology and common questions relating to internet streaming in the United States. 
Uh, there's a lot of terminology and some of the basic questions that are answered there might be helpful in you following today in helping you follow today's conversation, especially if this is a, a newer topic to you. And so we just recommend that you check that check that out. We also um, want to mention that we have decided to be very specific regarding the territory in which we're discussing today being the United States, simply because so many laws and policies that affect this issue vary from country to country. So with all of that in mind, let's get started. I turn it over to Liz for our first question. Hi, everyone. So COVID-19 um, has exponentially increased the number of performances on streaming platforms. Um, without the ability to have in-person audiences, um, musicians have been faced with the challenge of producing and sharing their art in a relevant way. Um, it's hard to go anywhere online without seeing someone performing a composition from their living room with their family or in an empty concert hall. Um, so with so much digital content being produced right now, how has this changed your normal operations at each of your organizations? Anyone who wants to start? is more than welcome. I can start there. Um, it really has put us in a, a new direction. You know, we've never before been in a sense where a lot of, you know, how to get the music out there, how to keep it alive, how to keep it not just for orchestras, but for also schools as well. So, you know, we, you know, basically that's our goal right now is to keep the music alive. It really has changed from you know, your standard mechanical licenses and, and standard sync licenses to having orchestras want to put their you know, previous works for their patrons, for their sponsors, just to make sure their sponsors know they're still alive. So that's really changed us. I mean, we've never had to deal with that in the past before. And now, you know, that's what we have to deal with. We have to make it available. We have to keep on working with orchestras. So it's an interesting time. Yeah, I pick up on that comment um, and just say that, you know, we've seen, you know, dramatic change in, in, in what is the activity, you know, the activity of our rental library and our licensing department. Um, most of the activity we see now is streaming requests, of course, and, and we're, you know, obviously working with uh, every organization on a case by case basis to be as flexible as possible to help them uh, facilitate these changes. And um, our goal, uh, similarly, is to be sure that our music, our composers, uh, the the the, uh, the entire catalogs, all the catalogs that we represent, um, are also you know out there. Uh, audiences are experiencing that music, and we don't see you know too much cessation of activity. Of course, there has been quite a bit, but but with the streaming and um, you know it, with experiences or conversations I've had with colleagues and even with audience members, you know this is keeping it alive at least um, through this uh, real crisis period and. And uh, you know we're excited to work with organizations to make sure that continues. Yeah, and to pick up on that, Norman too. This is this is a new thing, um, you know, for many organizations and relatively new, just in the general licensing landscape. Um, you know, we a, a concert online or performance online isn't as good as in person, but um, right. we want to do everything we can to help everyone get the music out there. In the, in the only way that's possible right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and you know, for our part, yeah, I agree. This is not entirely new, and, but when we would get these sort of requests in the past, they were uh, just occasional. Uh, given the, the influx, the volume that we've been getting of, of these kind of license requests, uh, we're having to formulate a, a better plan uh, as to how to address it. And what I think is interesting is that we're seeing an entire infrastructure being set up for this industry. People are going to become accustomed to this. And so while public performance is, you know, always preferable, once people get accustomed to doing this, this might be a value added kind of thing. And we're, we're looking to the future thinking this is not going to go away, um, even when things get back to normal. Sure. And I'll also just add on, this is probably obvious to most people, but the fact that so many people want to stream music it, it's a testament to the power of it you know that and and the fact that you're right it doesn't always necessarily have to be confined to the concert hall you know it's people are really trying to create community i think that's a powerful thing and if i like if i can jump in on what karen said um similarly it's um i find it 
um, encouraging that people want to bring more and more people together through music. Um, it's easy to sort of think about negative things, but I think a glimmer of hope in our industry for everyone is um, rather encouraging and something that kind of gets everyone through the day and through their lives. Absolutely. Could I just add a point, uh, you know, because I'm talking now for, for a group of publishers rather than any particular publisher. Um, at least 65 to 70% of the income of the classical publishers that I know of comes from rental and grand rights, which means that they have lost all of that income just as much as the performing groups have lost it. Another point that I uh, like to remind people of is that under almost all US uh, composer publisher contracts, a very substantial part of the rental and even more substantial part sometimes of the grand right fees goes to the composers. So when publishers ask for fees, those fees are going to support not just them, but the composers as well. We realize everybody's in a terrible economic situation right now. And, you know, individual compose, uh, p publishers will be as accommodating as they can, but that is also part of the reality. And I would wish that people would keep that in mind as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed. All right, thank you everyone. Um, why don't we turn it over to Jim right now? I think something that would be helpful for us is to get a, especially for a lot of our viewers, um, we have a lot of performers tuning in today, a lot of administrators, uh, and, may, and, and a lot of people who don't dabble in this arena very much, but are involved in creating content and are trying to get it out there. And so we just want to get some of the terminology and some basic things about licensing, because we're going to be talking a lot about licensing, and we want to get that out there and clarified. So, uh, so Jim, let me get your slides put up here. And, and if you would talk us through that, that would sure. be wonderful. Sure. Um, just a preliminary note. The last time that there was a comprehensive revision of the US copyright law was in 1978. And the, uh, the, the big technological advance that we were dealing with then was the photocopy machine. And as all of the various technological changes have come through over the intervening uh, 40 some years, uh, the copyright law has either uh, had a few bolt-ons like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or it has tried to stretch old concepts to fit new uses, sometimes with um, unintended results, both positive and negative. So what I'm going to show you now is a couple of different kinds of streaming and what rights in the U.S. you actually need to do them. We can then get into the question of, you know, where do you get those rights, which I'll try and touch on a little bit as we go through. So the first type of uh, streaming, if you go to the next slide, is a non-dramatic performance of a non-interactive audio only stream. That means a, the user cannot choose when to listen to a work like a radio broadcast. That I would think is by far the minority of what you are dealing with uh, in the orchestra world uh, and the opera world. But uh, if you would go back, um, what you would need to do that is if you had rented the performance materials, you need to see uh, whether the rental agreement covers streaming, or if not, you have to go back and talk to the publisher. And then you need the performing right covered. Performing right organizations like ASCAP and BMI usually cover that for live performances. They will also cover it for internet, but there are some internet service providers that already have those licenses like YouTube, Facebook, uh, and Instagram, so you wouldn't need to get a special license. If it's your own website, that you would have to get a license from the Performing Rights Society or from the publisher, if the publisher is willing to, to include that. Next slide, please. A uh, non-dramatic performance on an interactive audio-only stream. This is what we're usually dealing with. It's where the user can select what they want to hear um, and hear it when they want to. If again, if the performance materials were rented, you may need to deal with the publisher on a uh, supplemental uh, rental agreement. Uh, the performing right license is usually the performing rights society, ask after BMI, or maybe, as I said, the internet service provider already has it. And then you need something called a mechanical license. You usually hear about that in the uh, area of uh, making and selling sound recordings, but it also applies to streams as well. Again, these are all concepts that came out of the old copyright law before any internet uh, was even contemplated and they're trying to stretch them to fit. Next slide, please. 
Uh, now you have a non-dramatic performance with a non-interactive audio-visual stream. Once you go into the world of audio-visual, in, in addition to the rental right, and the, uh, you also need a, uh, a synchronization right. A synchronization license is a license to allow you to record music on the soundtrack of a, uh, with time, uh, in time relation to visual images. So if it's shot from the stage or fully produced, it still is going to require a synchronization, right? Unless it is a one-time live stream shot from the stage, in which case nothing is being recorded and therefore a synchronization right is not needed. Once it's recorded, you need a sync license. Next slide, please. A non-dramatic performance with an interactive audiovisual stream? Well, same thing. It's the, you need to deal with the, with the rentals, you need to deal with the performing right, unless it's already dealt with by uh, PROs or the ISP. You need a mechanical right, you need a synchronization right, unless it's a one-time non-recorded live stream. Okay, that takes care of uh, non-dramatic. Dramatic performances, these are not covered by ASCAP and BMI. Uh, if you have a non-interactive audio-only stream, you deal with the publisher and both for any uh, needed extension to the rental agreement and also for the grant rights. Next. A uh, dramatic performance uh, with an interactive audio only stream, you need again to deal with the publisher for the, uh, the rentals, the grant rights, and probably in this case, uh, the publisher will also deal with the mechanical rights. Next. A dramatic performance with a non-interactive audio visual stream, you need the rental rights, you need the performing rights, you need the synchronization right, unless it's a one-time live stream. And finally, uh, dramatic performance, the next slide, uh, dramatic performance with an interactive audio visual stream, you need the rental rights, you need the grand rights, you need the mechanical rights, you need the synchronization rights. Again, some publishers will do a, a one-stop license. Uh, others uh, may be using outside agencies or it's a foreign publisher that's being represented by another company such as Boozy or European American. So there can be variations within that. But basically, there are four potential rights. You need a minimum of two of them, whatever you're doing, and you may need the third and or the fourth. Yep. Thank you, Jim. You know, we're getting a, a lot of questions here on social media, wondering if we can make that uh, those slides available on our website to people afterwards. And I just wonder, is that something that we could maybe make available for for, uh, for reference after this. Yes, uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely happy for you to do that. Great, so for all of you watching at home, uh, look for those, we'll put those on that FAQ page as a, as a, a link or additional um, resource. <clears throat> so there's a lot of terminology there and a lot of things uh, that we're gonna keep rehashing. And so uh, we just encourage those of you who this is new to, uh, to stay with us and follow along as we go. I wanted to throw out to the panel another question that's uh, trying to actually starting to get get into like practical application of this. And this is a rather generic scenario so we can adapt it and play with it as we need to, to, uh, to kind of cover all the different scenarios that people are encountering. So perhaps one of the most common things that comes up is a group of performers, maybe even just an individual performer, but let's for this sake say two or three people are getting together in someone's living room. And they're going to play a piece of copyrighted music um, and they are going to do it on Facebook Live. So it will include video. We're going to uh, assume that for now. Uh, it's on Facebook Live. What things do they need to be aware of and consider before initiating such a stream? Who would like to respond to that? I'll start. Um, so going back to Jim's slides, um, he did talk about the uh, the performance license there that would be needed. So we're talking about a live element here. Um, and number one is, is a performance license. Um, and in the, the platform does matter. So Facebook versus on the, um, a, a, an organization's website, does that organization have ASCAP licenses in place? That's important to note. Um, and then it depends on what is being streamed in this live setting, but uh, synchronization rights might come to play as well. Um, so so we, we would advise anyone to check with the publisher to see if, if those would apply. And uh, you know we're, we're always happy to help answer questions and, and work with everyone on that end. Are there any factors that might determine whether synchronization licenses apply? 
Yeah, I mean, it depends if it's going to be um, available for replay later on um, or if it's just going to live for that one time live stream. Um, and again, I know this wasn't your scenario, but um, if it's if it's a pre recorded video that is being played, um, these factors come into play. Yeah. Yeah, I think Kevin, well, Kevin alluded to, I think when you're recording something on Facebook Live, I think it defaults to staying up even after the recording is over. So if that's the case, you would need to make sure you had the proper licensing in place if that video is going to remain in an on-demand function after, after the performance is over. If I were to go on and delete the video as soon as the live performance concludes, that would solve that issue? Yeah, I, I think we're also getting at least in, in my perspective over the last month and a half or so, you talk, like they've been kind of combos. We're doing a one day live and then we want to keep it up for six months uh, on our website or on YouTube or something like that. So we're getting a lot of these combo type requests from people that are they're doing a great Facebook live and then, you know what, we want to post it to our YouTube page after that. So there is that, as my buddy Kevin was saying, there is you know, that combination that there will be a synchronization license needed if they're going to keep it up. Thanks, Jay. Your connection is just a little choppy there, but I think we caught what you were saying. So thanks for that. Anyone else want to jump in on this scenario or uh, what well, somebody? Yeah, please. Sure. I, this might be something you were going to ask later, but um, just given the reality of the world we're living in right now, I think um, a common scenario would be where someone is wanting to perform something, but they want to arrange it for the forces they have. Um, and if that's the case, they should know that they also need permission to make that arrangement. Um, they need to contact the publisher for that. Often, you know, the composer has the right to say yes or no, um, you know, and that's understandable. Just imagine you, you're a composer and you wrote a beautiful, peaceful piece. You don't want someone to arrange it for 12 kazoos, you know, <laughs> uh, but whatever the scenario, um, really, it's just a matter of ask the publisher. Um, and that way you don't have to wonder was I allowed to do that or not. And to clarify, we're speaking if someone's going to make an arrangement of a copyrighted work. Correct. Yes. So if you were arranging something. Arrange Bach all you want. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and I was going to say this at some point later on as well, but um, I think when it comes to any any works under copyright, um, the safe bet is always to just ask, and we really appreciate it. And this goes back to what, what Jim was talking about earlier. We appreciate it for ourselves. We also appreciate it for our composers. Um, you know, uh, we want to see our composers um, compensated with royalties because we want them to keep on supplying us great music and everyone else great music. Um, so, but but... We, we just appreciate the, the question. And even if we decide to uh, give a, a gratis, no fee, um, it's, it's still, you know, um, it's still a license. We are, we are licensed to uh, you, you know, for, a, for free. Um, but the question itself is really appreciated for, for everybody at the table. Absolutely. And if I can jump in on what Jim said too, just keeping us a part of the conversation and the dialogue is always appreciated. Uh, we would much rather know beforehand than after because that makes it a little bit trickier. Like Karen said, if it's an arrangement of a copyrighted work from, uh, you know, a composer, they might have issues with it. You know, we want to make sure that everyone is comfortable with the usage before moving forward. Yeah, I would pick up on the, everything that's just been said um, uh, and just add to it that if you have a question about whether a sync right is required, you know, the best thing to do with a copyrighted or work under protection is contact the publisher, you know, uh, contact who you know at the publisher and that person will put you in touch with the right person who will appreciate the question and will walk you through it um, very clearly um, in all instances. And uh, with all of my colleagues, I, I find that that, uh, that is really the best route to go. And um, we are happy to, you know, provide guidance on that case by case basis. Absolutely. Great. I have a couple of questions. I, I actually ahead, wanted Kevin. to ask about that. Um, we, I was going to tell everyone where to go for our specific company. Um, were you going to bring that up later? In, oh, please. In, this would be a good time for that. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know if I. Um, so we just we're and we're updating our page constantly, especially given the recent, um, you know, questions that are coming up with all of the uh, the COVID issues. But um, 
wisemusicclassical.com forward slash licensing. We have an FAQ page. We have all, the, all of our contacts and um, hopefully that's a good resource uh, for anyone that's looking to license Shermer Works uh, and all the other publishers that we control. Right. And we recently updated our website as well to include a FAQ page on our orders and requests tab on the homepage for Shop EAM. And you can just go to that page. It's all clearly laid out and you can actually make a request for webcasting, broadcasting, um, to the, which will then transfer directly to our library um, and to the appropriate person who can answer your questions. You notice too, um, people sometimes they don't know where to go, who's the publisher, who owns this music. So we tell a lot of people sometimes you can go to ASCAP and BMI, Harry Fox, and you know, search for the works there and they'll tell you who the publisher is. So that's a lot of sometimes I, I get some Shermer works and some, you know, other works, but if people are are don't know who the publisher is, there are ways to ask Gap and BMI and Harry Fox to find out who to go to. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. And and I get requests from colleagues sometimes and say, hey, hey, is this your work? Uh, do you know who the publisher? I'll just I'll pass it on to Boozy or I'll pass the yep. request to a colleague at Peer or you know to Shermer's uh, to Wise Music. So so yeah, absolutely don't hesitate absolutely. if you have a question. Yep. And if you do know uh, who the publisher is, but you don't know how to contact them, um, on the MOLA Frequently Asked Questions page that I know is a, a resource you have access to, there are some links I noticed, which you'll see, to those PRO um, mm -hmm. song searches, but also on MPA, there's a directory of the publishers. So if you know, hey, this says on the sheet music, this is print uh, published by Pure Music, you can search for that and you'll find a contact info that you can reach out to. And also a good resource too for those that want to do a deep dive. This might be the, the information studies uh, person inside me. Uh, Worldcat.org mm -hmm. is also a great resource if it's especially an obscure work or something like that. It's always a great resource that um, I know a lot of people on this panel and myself use even for weird inquiries for Odd, oddball selections that you know, <laughs> not everyone knows. Right, anybody else want to uh, have any, any advice where people should look before we? Oh, I'll just chime in real quick from the performer's perspective. Uh, once you, these are all great resources, ASCAP, BMI, uh, MPA, I use them regularly. And um, I find once you figure out who the publisher is, all of these publishers do a great job of listing, you know, contact info, most of them have just a generic licensing email and they'll shoot you to who you, who you need to talk to. So I, I, I feel like if you go to their website, look under licensing or copyright, you'll usually find what you're looking for. Yeah. And if you end up contacting someone who isn't in charge of that, they'll pass you along to the right person. I think the important thing is to reach out in the first place. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're ourselves, not, not a huge publisher. We're, we're all working most in, in the same office. Um, so usually, uh, you, you, even if you call the phone, um, the person who usually answers will just walk over to the person who handles the copyrights. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a huge deal. Very true. <laughs> and I just want to jump in real quick um, to ask about a concern that, that I've um, heard from, from quite a few of my colleagues. Um, since we're talking about communication with um, the publishing companies when we're seeking out the right type of license for a specific piece, um, you know, there are some instances where we, we don't receive a response back um, in a certain amount of time or we may get, um, you know, transferred around from company to company trying to figure out the, the right person to talk to. What would you recommend um, for anyone who feels like maybe they've exhausted all forms of communication trying to facilitate obtaining a license. Do you have any recommendations or suggestions for that? Well, ultimately you can always go to the Library of Congress back when, you know, when they get back in the operation. And uh, for works that are prior, uh, were registered prior to 1978, you have to either go there or get a search firm to go there. For works that were registered in 1978 and later, you can do it now at loc.gov or copyright.gov. And you know you get the information as to who the owner of record is. Um, if the, 
an, 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 an attempt to uh, contact the owner of record is unsuccessful and none of the normal industry uh, things that were mentioned already, ASCAP, BMI, Harry Fox, Cat Search, all these different things are, are unavailing. You've done what you can. Now that doesn't mean you have an, you're not excused from copyright infringement, but you would certainly, if you've documented your search, you would certainly have a good position to say, well, we should only pay what what a normal uh, a normal licensing fee should be, because you know we shouldn't be you know uh, uh, subject to punitive damages of any kind because we did everything we could do and you were hiding. So okay, now you're here. Now we'll pay you, but we're not going to you know, have, uh, you know, big damages over and above a normal license fee. So that's the best advice I can give you. Thank you. And within, if you know you're at the right publisher, but you're trying to figure out who you're supposed to talk to, my piece of advice would be give as much information in the first communication as you can about the details. You know, is this going to be, what platform is it on? YouTube or Facebook or your own website? Is it going to be available forever? For a day, you know, all of those things, um, obviously the title, the composer, all of those things, um, the performer. And a lot of that information might make sure that you get to the right person first instead of being passed around. And it's a bit adjacent to that, but um, sometimes we'll, we'll get contacted about a piece of music that either was formerly a copyright of ours um, and is no longer uh, the right returned. Um, or, uh, as, as somebody mentioned, uh, perhaps uh, someone shared the name. For example, I, I know Karen Pure Music has an imprint, Southern, and we have Southern. In fact, and we get a lot. I send people we get, to We get many, many folks. Often. Yes, yes, it, <laughs> likewise. Um, so, you know, it, I, I think um, you know, as an industry, we're, we're very happy to help each other out. Uh, and, you know, because um, this helps us. It, it helps see the whole concept of copyright if, if we're, and, and the strength of copyright if we're helping other publishers out uh, yeah, as it regards to that. Um, I will say that for the sometimes we do a dead, a dead end. We try to help out uh, customers who are interested in pieces where there's a bit of a copyright dead end. Um, but, um, and, and some, but that goes back to what, what Jim was saying. If, if you can't get anything at all, that's a different matter. Um, so, we, so. Thank you, everyone. We have a, a good comment, I think, that uh, came in here on Facebook. Uh, Julie Kim uh, makes a, uh, a comment and a question here. Uh, we are finding that the administrative effort and time to reach out to all the various publishers is extremely time consuming and labor intensive for both our side as well as the publisher's side. Is there any way to streamline things so that there can be more of a blanket reach that covers all publishers rather than having all the multiple correspondences and redirects and things like that? I, I don't, there might not be an answer to this. Anyone wanna, wanna respond to that? Well, there is an answer to this. The answer is no, you can't do it. Uh, the only reason that ASCAP and BMI are allowed to exist with representation of, of you know, hundreds of thousands of copyrights is because they have a consent decree with the US Justice Department that gives them uh, a certain degree of antitrust immunity that enables them to license you know, on a blanket basis. Unless you're gonna go and get that for this kind of situation, there's no legal way to do it. I'm really sorry about that, but that, that's what it is. That answers a yeah, lot and, of questions from, that are showing up in our feed right now. From a publisher's perspective too, um, you know, it depends on the composition, but some some estates, some writers, we have uh, approvals that we have to go to them for. So right. we, we can't just offer a blanket, um, you know, kind of thing up front. We, we would have to treat every kind of request in, in a different way. I want yeah, to redirect. I mean, yeah, go ahead. I mean, you know, it, each individual publisher can look at their systems and you know, uh, whether there are any internal efficiencies or whatever that could be done, but on, on an industry-wide basis, as I said, it just can't, can't happen. So uh, Karen, you had mentioned something earlier that um, we, we, we hit and then we kind of moved on. I want to come back to, and that was the idea of arranging things. Sure. Um, and, and you kind of answered it, I think, with the kazoo scenario. But uh, one question we've had come in quite a bit uh, has to do with the idea of transcriptions. And so um, I just want to dwell on that maybe for, for a few more seconds or another minute or so here. 
Um, what if uh, an individual musician wants to record a piece on voice and piano that was, um, or written for voice and piano with instrument and piano? Like, is that, is that, do they need permission to, is that considered an arrangement? Or if you take a choir piece, but you play it on instruments. So this is a question a lot of people have about is, and we're so of course speaking that the original piece is, is a protected under copyright here. Sure. Um, something that I think is helpful to just remember as a broad concept is that copyright is a bundle of rights, right? The owner of that intellectual property has the right to, you know, say if it can be performed or not, or recorded or not, and in what fashion. Um, so personally, I would say if you have a question about is this an arrangement, just ask. Um, because, you know, for instance, if you're saying that it was voice and piano, which theoretically probably has lyrics, and now you're gonna play it on violin and piano, well, the lyrics are gone. That does, in my mind, that changes the composition, you know, so always best just to ask. Yeah, and I, 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 yeah I would just add um, that, you know, because we're also representing the composers, uh, and I think this is what, what Karen was alluding to earlier with the, the kazoo arrangement, um, that, you know, Sometimes composers feel very strongly about a piece and sometimes they don't. I, I know we, we have a, a particular composer who has one piece um, where, you know, he is, he has asked us to never ever allow anything to be done to this because it's very emotionally important to him. And as his representative, uh, we would never offer to do so. Um, so again, this is just to, to back up the idea that, you know, we appreciate when folks ask. Um, you know, these types of questions because it's, it's not just it's not just us, but it's also the composers. Um, you know that, that we're trying to protect. You know, not just not just their royalties, but also their vision of their music. Yeah, I would echo that and just say that um, you know, in instances where I've had requests for arrangements, in most cases, when I go to the composers, they are actually you know interested and 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 engaged by the approach and. Um, and we'll consider it. And, and in most cases, um, we are able to move forward with those. So, um, you know, unless there's a, um, you know, as, um, as, you know, we just heard, I mean, if there's a, if there's a particular reason why or a particular arrangement or change to the music, uh, that is, you know, the composer objects to, then that would be a different scenario. But in most cases in, that I've worked with, we've had, um, you know, arrangements go through yeah, and that's usually yeah. the case here as well. But it's, it's yeah. the exceptions I think we, we always try to watch out for. Exactly, Jim. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Along those lines, I also wanted to ask if you could provide some clarification um, about when a performance is considered a cover um, and kind of what that process of licensing um, performing a cover looks like. What do you mean by a cover in this case? What I usually think of as a cover is a pop song that another artist has written being sung by a second artist in their own style. But that would, how does that apply to the orchestra field? So obviously with, with um, you know, musicians trying to push various types of content out. Um, we have received some questions from many of our, of our symphonic colleagues um, where they have been asked by musicians in the ensemble um, if they can perform a cover of a pop chart um, on their own instrument or, you know, in their own voice. Um, and so we're just kind of looking for um, some words of wisdom to how to help direct them if they're looking to do that sort of thing. Well, it's a bit vague, I, don't know that you know? I, I don't know if I have words of wisdom, but I do have some experience. So if my colleagues won't mind, let me just take the first crack at this. Um, if you're talking about a, uh, a pop song that somebody wants to play on their instrument, um, that is two things. It's a performance for sure, which may or, you know, be covered by the ASCAP or BMI licenses or the PRO or whatever. Uh, it could be three things. Could be, you know, there may be a recording involved, but it's also an arrangement. This, this, is, this is no different than the situation we were talking about before about taking a song and playing it with violin and replacing the voice and thereby eliminating the words. So you would need, 
uh, what the technical copyright term for any work that is based on another work is a derivative work. And the right to make a deriv derivative work is one of the six uh, exclusive rights of the copyright holder. Uh, so you would need the permission of the copyright holder to do that. Uh, what about, um, you know, some some of the military bands, some other bands and, and in academia, you know, uh, University of Michigan, they, I'm sure they have jazz groups, rock groups. Um, what if they were performing this this pop tune kind of in, in the exact instrumentation of the original? Would that still be a, a, a cover then? If they are performing in the exact instrumentation of the original, no, it would simply be a performance of the original. And that, you know, uh, again, assuming it, it, you have the issues of whether it's a recording, whether it's a public performance, et cetera, but that would be okay vis-a-vis -vis the actual uh, content of what they're playing. If they, but we get requests all the time and a lot of the, you know, companies and, and other clients that I work with for a marching band arrangement of this piece or that piece or something which wasn't written for marching band. That's a derivative work. The uh, copyright owner can say yes or no and under what conditions. I, I think Jim raises a, a great point. Um, a lot of times we receive mechanical license requests for our works that say we want to do symphony number two, but we want to change it to, you know, piano versus harp or something like that. And it's not really just a mechanical license. I think a lot of people think that it is compulsory. And by just doing a request, you know, it, it's mechanical license. It's not. In, in our world, in the classical world, it really is an arrangement. And so I have to explain to people sometimes, because you're changing the music to fit your instrumentality, it's an arrangement license as well. So that's something that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I hope that um, throughout this crisis that people understand is that if you are changing the character of something, um, you do have to have permission. It's not like, uh, you know, like Jay said, it's it's not simply a mechanical. It is it's an arrangement. You're taking something that is a fixed, definite instrumentation and changing it. Permission will be needed. Just automatically assume that. Uh, 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 Eric, a softball question for you. The, sure. uh, the Juilliard mashup, Juilliard mashup of Bolero, was that considered an arrangement? Did that require permission? Um, yeah, technically it was an Not arrangement. the Philharmonic, the Juilliard. Yeah, yeah, Juilliard. Oh, yeah, technically an arrangement, yeah, because they were changing parts of the character. Well, this I think this is a good time. We're gonna actually um, we're gonna do a little a little little commercial break here, just for those who maybe are are joining us uh, uh, midstream and uh, didn't catch everything at the beginning. Um, we are going to just want to remind everyone of our website, which is here, that you can find the FAQs that people are referencing. Uh, click on the education link at the top, and you can go there. Uh, and find those resources. Also, it looks like we've had no problem with this, but if you're watching us, just a reminder that you can join the conversation on that on the social media platform of your choice. And also to find more resources about our virtual Vancouver conference at this link. Uh, the last thing I wanna mention right now is uh, if you'd like to support MOLA in future educational endeavors and resources, such as this session that you're viewing today, simply go to our website, scroll down on the homepage and click on how to donate. Uh, it's through these donations that we're able to support a wide variety of educational initiatives. Uh, with that, I wanna just transition to some question, one question that does come up a lot, but we don't wanna get too deep into this today because we could spend the entire session on it, I'm sure, but is the issue that comes up of fair use. And so what you see in front of you is, the, is from our FU, FAQ page, and I'm just going to read this quickly, and then I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Jim Kendrick uh, if he has anything to add to it. In the United States copyright law, fair use allows the unlicensed use of copyrighted materials in certain circumstances. Fair use exemptions are nebulous and vaguely written. The case law is inconsistent, and the only way to truly determine a fair use is in a court of law. 
because of any claim of fair use, because any claim of fair use brings a possibility of legal action. It may be best for this to be an organizational philosophy where an informed management can consider the amount of risk they're willing to take. And we have some links on our website as well that can help you. Jim, do you have anything to add to this? Well, what I would say is that your uh, statement there is a very good summary of the actual state of the law. Um, fair use does indeed exist, but nobody can quite describe what it is. And uh, what you really have to look at in most cases is whether what you want to do that you want to claim as a fair use is a use that a copyright owner reasonably has an expectation to be paid for in normal circumstances. Uh, and with that in mind, I would just start with what I think is an easy proposition, uh, which is that the uh, streaming uh, of a entire piece of music, whether it's a three minute song or a, you know, 120 minute uh, symphony is never going to be fair use. Uh, it, it simply, it, you know, the, the fact that only a few people are going to see it is irrelevant. Uh, you would be taking the entire work without compensation and there is no basis in fair use for doing that. Uh, where fair use normally comes in is when people want to use small excerpts. You know, if you want to do a, uh, a little clip of, uh, you know, to show the kinds of ranges of things that your orchestra can play and you want to throw up a couple of, you know, one minute or two minute clips of something, you might have an argument that it's fair use, although the business practices as they exist and those are relevant, uh, is that those are not fair use, but you, you know, it, it, you'd be closer to the mark than you are by trying to put up an entire piece. Um, there's also uh, some myths that commonly go around, and this is the last thing I'll say about it. Is for one, 30 seconds use is always okay. Well, if you think of the, uh, if you think of the length of the average television commercial, it's 30 seconds. And the cost of music for a television commercial can run into the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars for a well-known piece of music. The other is, you know, 50 words of text is always okay. Carl Sandburg's Fog is about 18 words. Do you think you can use the whole thing for free anytime you want? No. So there are no such things as, as uh, there are no bright line tests. There are no numerical or percentage guidelines. You're kind of in a, in a, in a world where common sense should be your starting place, but also leavened with a keen understanding that the law is very, very unclear. I just want to add a, a, a maybe another a scenario that has been brought to our attention and, and then let some of the, the rest of you respond to this issue as well. Uh, one scenario that was brought forward was that, you know, there are a lot of musicians who want to like do excerpts and it might be an excerpt of a copyrighted piece of music, an audition excerpt. It's written for a larger group of instruments. They're only playing their part. They're only playing a short part of it, maybe even in a teaching video for teaching these audition excerpts. And so that's a question that comes up from a lot of my colleagues. I'm curious, uh, we'll just add that into the basket and uh, without taking too much time, give the rest of our panelists an opportunity to respond to this issue of fair use. Okay, I would just caution that we don't talk about individual companies' business practices in this context. What they can do is, is give, give their thoughts as to what that might be, but please don't say, this Mar company always does this or that. Yeah, I, I, this goes back to uh, what we've talked about, uh, just encouraging people to ask, because uh, a publisher uh, might very well, when they know the details and the plans, um, you know, uh, offer that opportunity to, I mean, they, they'll waive a fee. Right, so a publisher may very well do that because it's a case by case basis. But um, you know, unless you ask, you don't know, and that's why we, you know, always always want to be kept in the conversation on that kind of thing. And and you might be uh, oftentimes very uh, pleasantly surprised uh, about how easy that is. Well, yeah, I don't think there's a whole lot more to say about this. So um, I think it's a good time for us to pivot. And, um, you know, one question that we definitely hear about a lot is who's responsible for the licenses. So let's something that has become very common during COVID is a musician or a group of musicians uh, who are employed by an ensemble or organization may get together themselves and put something together um, that they want to upload. Then the, the employing organization may or may not uh, or may take a, a variety of levels of kind of promoting this. They may simply retweet, re, reshare, 
all those sorts of things. They may add their logo at the beginning. They may, they may actually upload it instead of sharing it to their social media pages or their website. So the question that we've had from our audience is who's responsible for that licensing and obtaining that licensing? If I may, ultimately, the party who puts it up on the Internet is the, is the responsible party. And so if that and that could be multiple parties in the case of retweetings and, and uh, postings. So th that's that's the legal answer. Right. I would echo that as well. What Jim just said, I mean, for my understanding would be it would be the entity that that's putting up the stream would be responsible for um, obtaining the license. That wouldn't, you know, stop someone right. from, you know, th that is the answer, obviously, but that wouldn't stop uh, a um, organization and individual members from having their own agreement saying, okay, you're going to put this on your website, but you are responsible for getting the license for it. So that can be arranged as well. Sure. I mean, you have anyone who posts to Facebook has an agreement with Facebook. It's called the terms of service. And that says who's responsible for what. If you put up content that isn't cleared, uh, they're going to look to you to be uh, liable if there's a problem. Yeah, kind of to jump in and, and ask a follow up question. Um, many Facebook, well, many orchestras um, and ensembles have uh, musicians of Facebook pages. Um, if there was an instance where um, the you know more official um, ensemble Facebook page and the musicians of Facebook page kind of wanted to jointly um, stream something, are those um, rights transferable in any way? Are they connected or would both um, pages have to pursue rights individually? Well, the, uh, if I may, the uh, making of the recording, because I'm assuming this is a recorded performance, uh, the responsibility for that is whoever was uh, responsible for making the recording. So if it was the group of musicians and, uh, you know, they uh, got a, a synchronization agreement from a publisher, uh, it would be important for that license to allow multiple postings on other sites. Normally, you know, you're only going to give a, the publisher's only going to give a license for what they're asked to give a license. For. So if, but it's the same as a, as a rental agreement, you, you, you rent material for a live performance, then you decide you want to stream the performance, go back to the publisher and you get an extension, which will cover the streaming. You can do the same thing in this situation as well. But the, uh, once that recording is made, then, you know, it's a question, A, if it's allowed to be posted on the, on the multiple sites, and then whoever's got the relationship with the site is the one that's responsible to the site for having cleared the rights. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Okay. That's, uh, maybe that's a good uh, transition here. I just, maybe we can re recap a little bit on this. Uh, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, let's just take a moment and talk a little bit about the parent, who, who's, I don't, when I say responsible, I don't mean our previous conversation, who, who's responsible for the different types of rights. So I think, you know, just to clarify, um, and anyone correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, so we have uh, a live performance. That means uh, the ensemble is playing live and that stream is going out live. Uh, in that case, it seems that the understanding is that the performing rights organizations, which in the US is generally for our our, our, our purposes, ASCAP and BMI, um, that they have the necessary licenses to be able to cover that. And that, that is something we would work out with the pros. Now, however, if the stream then is archived on a platform or if it's a pre-recorded item that's uploaded at that point, especially if videos and well, not especially, but if video is involved, we now enter the realm of synchronization licensing for which we would go through the individual publishers to acquire that. But there's a wild card in this and something that maybe some of our viewers who aren't librarians or administrators aren't entirely uh, familiar with is this idea of music rentals. So music rentals have a contract that accompanies them. They, um, we sign that contract. It has ter terms that limit the use of that physical music that we are renting 
from them and therefore seems to have uh, a, a bit more purview in some areas than when we're dealing with like a Bartok string quartet or some other like copyrighted piece of music that's available for sale, like Hoedown would be something or, or things like this. So can we just talk a, a little bit, if anyone wants to add clarification, anything I said, please do. But also, can we talk about where does that purview of the rental library, uh, rental works come in and does it supersede or take the place of, um, does it cloud the, the issue of, of what rights are necessary for these different types of streams? Well, again, we're not going to talk about any particular publishers' uh, rental contracts because they, they do differ in some respects. Um, but if, let, let's just go with your assumption that a, if the rental contract is for live performance and somebody wants to then let, forget streaming, they just want to broadcast that performance, an additional rental fee is payable for that. If they want to take those parts and take them into the recording studio and make a commercial recording, an additional fee may be payable for that as well, because the, it, it all depends on what the contract says. If, he, if you can do whatever the contract says you can do, and you can't do anything that the contract doesn't say you can do without getting further permission. So that's, it's a question of looking at, your, looking at your rental contracts that govern the live performance, which you did an archival of, which you now want to put on the internet. Yeah. On a related note, um, I, I feel like I hear relatively often someone say, well, I bought this piece of music, say a string quartet or something, I bought it, I own it, so now I can do whatever I want with it. I can perform it, I can, you know, and just just to clarify that that's, that's not the case. <laughs> um, so in terms of, you know, your, as Jim said, you know, if you rented the materials, look at the contract, see what it says. Uh, but certainly if it's a piece of music you bought, you know, for sale, you have no kind of contract for how you can use it. So you do need to, procure either performance license and synchronization license, depending on the situation. Um, just because you own the sheet of music doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, that's actually enshrined in the copyright law. We're not, it's not a question of business practices. That's what it says. So. Exactly. I just want to jump in there real quick to say along the lines of understanding what your rental contracts say, um, I don't know, you know, who all might have access to their blanket licenses with the pros, but I found at least in my work working for a university that understanding what my blanket license says has been immensely helpful. So I just want to say that if anyone has access to look at their um, blanket license, obviously in addition to understanding your rental licenses um, or to ask you know, for legal assistance from, from real legal counsel in order to um, kind of translate it, that's very, very beneficial. Any other thoughts on this? Well, I'll just say that, you know, as I explained earlier, we are uh, trying to deal with a 42 year old copyright law in a world that has changed exponentially faster than it did between the, the, the previous copyright law in 1909. Um, we are trying to fit, you know, five pounds of something in a, ten, in a two pound bag. Uh, that's what, why you end up having to have four different rights to get a, to, you know, an audiovisual stream up there. Uh, not to make anyone feel bad, but the European Union adopted a copyright law about 20 years ago where they added a new right called the communication to the public right, which kind of handles all this stuff. Uh, you know, one stop and you're done. Uh, I wish and hope that someday it will be the case here as well, but I'm sorry to say it's not now. I think this is a good opportunity to talk about um, a scenario that uh, someone raised that we we just like to see how you all respond to this. Um, ensemble A or X or whatever uh, has recorded commercially a work that at the time was available as a CD or DVD. Um, they got the necessary mechanical licenses to make that happen. For some viewers who don't know, Harry Fox Agency is a place where normally that happens, um, which we haven't spent a lot of time talking about today. So COVID happens they now want to stream the same recording on a streaming platform. Uh, let's assume it's a single copyrighted work just for the sake of this, this conversation. Um, 
what licenses are necessary for them to do that? Well, if, if I can just kick it off, uh, I, are, you're assuming that this is a commercially recorded um, CD that's been available for sale. Now, there you go back to the difference between interactive and non-interactive. If it's non-interactive, in other words, it's being webcast, the user either hears it or doesn't, depending on when they're tuning in, um, they can get a license from an organization called Sound Exchange, which handles the licensing of master recordings for streaming uh, on behalf of virtually all of the major labels and many, many smaller labels. And they also need uh, their ASCAP and BMI license and they're good to go. When you get uh, more complicated is if you want to put it up on demand, in which case you have to go and go uh, deal with the record company as well as with the, the PRO uh, because the sound exchange does not handle interactive streaming. That's done label by label. Yeah, who owns the recording in your scenario, Justin? Yeah, that, that was not clarified. And but let's uh, let's say in this case, well, it's I, I asked if it was a commercially ensemble. released recording. Oh, I see. Yeah. If it's owned by the ensemble and it's not under an exclusive license to a distributor, to Naxos or anybody like that, then they could do it themselves. That's true. Um, if I may, just kind of. Um, go off of that with a with another scenario this time academia um as an academic performance librarian um i and many of my colleagues um have encountered faculty wanting to have um playlists of their solo or um conducting recordings commercially made um on their bio pages of our of our website um what, how, I guess, would that change the commercial nature um, of, of the scenario? I mean, what, what differences would um, we see um, in order to make sure that, you know, we could maintain compliance with this if it was even possible? Well, you'd need a, you'd need a license from the record companies. Uh, I'm assuming these are interactive. And I'm assuming they're also substantial excerpts or complete works. So you need the, you need the record company's permission to do that. Great. As well as ASCAP and BMI if there's any copyrighted material. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and transition us to another question. Uh, it's, it's been made clear and we definitely want to stay within the parameters of the law that we, we don't want anyone to speak to any specific policies or financial uh, aspects of pricing or anything like that. Uh, we've obviously received a lot of inquiries, uh, both ahead of this panel and we're seeing some uh, on the social media streams right now during the panel of, of people who are just very interested in discovering how that works. And so I'm gonna frame my question uh, this way. What types of factors, not speaking specifically to your, your organization's policy, affect streaming fees? Is there information or metrics that presenters and producers should be considering in order to manage their budgets when planning stream projects? So the inquiries we were getting, it seemed very obvious that uh, people want to do what's right. They want to pay what they're supposed to pay. It's very difficult because this is kind of unknown to so many of many, many people planning these, these uh, projects. Uh, it's unknown what kinds of factors come into play or even what ballpark fees could be in and therefore is very difficult for them in their planning stages. Would any of you be willing to, to just address these very broad perspectives that could help an administrator planning such a project? No ballpark fees, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, not ballpark fees, but like, um, yes, the broader issues here. Uh, as to what kind of factors? Sure, I'm, that, that there's no problem if anybody wants to jump in. I mean, obviously, uh, how long you want to put it up and what kind of, what platform you're using, but others should, should join in with those sorts of things. That's fine. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it, thank you. Um, it's not relevant uh, in this discussion, but we also do look at territory uh, when, when that uh, is applicable. Um, and we're talking about streaming. We'll actually also look at uh, subscriptions and view counts if that's also relevant. 
Um, so, you know, it's basically, let's say you're printing up on YouTube, large channel versus small channel, those, those types of things. Uh, but as Jim said, the other is, is term. So just how long uh, it'll be up um, and what platform you're putting it up on. Uh, and then we also will look at uh, whether or not where you're put, putting it up at is something that can be monetized. Uh, in some way. So that's also relevant to us. If you're, if you're just putting this out for free, uh, we would offer a, uh, you know, a, a different fee scale than we would uh, if you are going to be monetizing it either through subscriptions to the platform or kind of an e-ticket. You know, th those are the kind of questions we ask. And um, just to add on to that, the, the, you know, the basic, you know, foundation of this conversation is what rights are involved. So, um, you know, there's different options based on if it's just audio only, if it's audio visual um, and, and all the things, all the different scenarios we went over. Um, and then just another really general comment, you know, uh, each song is different and carries a different kind of, uh, you know, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but let's just say in a, an, an example of songs that aren't ours, but Frank Sinatra songs are not the same as, you know, your, your uncle who wrote a song and no one knows about it. And, um, I think that's important to kind of take into account too and, and something that people might might value when they're um, licensing work. Do we wanna talk about broadcast territory for a moment? I, I, I feel like that's a, a good thing for us to maybe, uh, since, it, since Jim brought it up, uh, that's something we've heard about as well. And on, honestly, one question we're getting, uh, we've been trying to be specific about, you know, the U.S. because of our laws being so unique and, and, and things, but we're hearing a lot from our Canadian colleagues about the, uh, the challenges. So this is kind of a twofold discussion uh, and, and feel free to take it however you will. One being in the United States, we're talking about uh, physical geography versus digital geography. Um, how does that work? You know, there are works that are under copyright in other countries that are not under copyright here. They're viewable on the platform in those other countries. Are they, are they not? How do we limit that? What, you know, what are those issues? There's the aspect of we're streaming from the US. How do we can, how does that broadcast territory uh, work and what kinds of things do we need to be concerned with? The second part of that, the second question we're hearing from our Canadian colleagues has to do with, they have a, a much less, uh, th their copyright term generally is, is shorter and therefore there's a lot of things that they stream, they're trying to stream that are public domain in Canada, but are available in the United States for streaming and are not uh, public domain in the United States. So either of those questions, I throw it out there and uh, do what you will with it. Well, the, the whole area of international copyright is extremely complicated. Uh, one of the main differences that you've mentioned is the difference in copyright term, although I'm told that the Canadian copyright term is going to be extended to match our copyright term, but we ourselves have two copyright terms. We have a copyright term for works that were uh, copyrighted or, or published before 1978 and a different copyright term for works that were published from 1978 onwards. And there are even subcategories in there as well. Um, look, it's, it's the ISMLP issue, just to say the dirty word um, out loud. Uh, there are lots of things that are in the public domain in Canada that are not in the public domain in the United States, possibly some things in, that are in the public domain here that are not in the public domain in Canada. Um, technically, there is no such thing as international copyright law. What there is is something called the Berne Convention, Berne as in Switzerland, which says that if a, an, uh, an American, to take an example, a uh, copyright owner has a work being infringed in Canada, they can go into a Canadian court and have the same rights and same remedies as a Canadian copyright owner would have, and vice versa. But it also means that in theory, with streaming, you'd have to go into court in many, many countries to get a full, you know, year, uh, full, full uh, relief from a, from a worldwide copyright infringement. I mean, this is a nightmare. I've spent nine or 10 years of my life in the 1990s on a major case involving this. So don't get me started, uh, and, and, or I will stop myself from getting started. But the reality is that we sort of live in an imperfect world. Uh, if a uh, US-based internet uh, service provider is fully licensed or, or a website is fully licensed and it goes out around the world, we just, appear to have accepted that there may be countries where that infringes the local copyrights, but they're either going to do something about it there or it's not going to happen. 
Uh, I don't, I, I was having this conversation with a client uh, yesterday, in fact, I'm going to be having it again later today, of how do we give a worldwide license? There are, you know, issues about whether a work is copyrighted in different countries because of different terms, but what if a work is fully copyrighted everywhere, but different people own the rights in different countries? I mean, most, not to pick on Norman, but most of the repertoire that Norman licenses emanates from Europe. Can he give a worldwide license? Only if the originating publisher says he can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is the kind of situation that we're in. This is another place where the copyright law does not work as it should. But uh, I don't know if that was helpful to the specific questions, but that's kind of how the world is at the moment. Yeah, we'll just leave it open for anybody else who wants to if you, if you have a perspective you'd like to share from where you sit on that. I, I know one thing that has come up is, and, and, and Jim, you alluded to a lot of this, is, is it is pretty pretty messy, is if somebody is trying to cover their bases. Well, first of all, I should say that there is a way, especially if you're using YouTube, that you can limit your broadcast territory. And that seems to be something that some people don't understand. So when you upload your stream, like you should, you should know that you can do that. Um, but if you don't want to limit your broadcast territory, then, and you want to try to have the licensing in the other, uh, other territories and do it properly, um, can you go through the U.S. agent um, or representative to license it in those other countries, or do you need to go, like, like yeah, does anyone have any response to, to any suggestion to somebody who would ask that question? I'd start with the U.S. representative because generally they can be in touch with the originating publisher. And if the originating publisher has the rights in the rest of the world, they could be authorized either to they, they could either be authorized to give a worldwide license or refer to the mothership in, in the home country. That's definitely the way to go to start. Right. Yeah, I'll echo that and just say, as because Jim mentioned um, that we are licensing uh, many uh, European works um, that, in fact, we have situations almost on a daily basis where requests come in for the works that uh, may, you know, that we would need to contact the originating publisher, whether it be in Vienna or uh, in Mainz or in London. And, um, you know, we would be, uh, you know, getting their input on that. And so that would be, um, and that's done on a regular basis. And it's uh, actually standard procedure. Um, it doesn't require any extra time. In most cases, there's, of course, a time lag sometimes because of the time difference. But but generally, we have very, you know, with all of our colleagues abroad, there's almost immediate responses. I just add another uh, aspect on the ASCAP BMI point of view. ASCAP and BMI cannot issue licenses for outside the U.S. They have affiliation agreements with societies around the world, but that is on the uh, repertoire input side not on the licensing side. Uh, this was a big question in the 90s when, when this was all starting up. And as I said, a business practice seems to have developed that if the transmitting uh, ISP is based in a country and holds the requisite PRO licenses, they do not have to get PRO licenses everywhere else in the world. Uh, and But one of the advantages, I'm not, I'm not pushing them obviously, but one of the advantages of going with a big ISP like a YouTube or, a, or an Instagram or something, is that they do have licenses which effectively, because they have uh, uh, uplinks in, in many countries, they have licenses that effectively cover a great part of the world. Uh, so you would reduce your potential liability, but I have to be honest, I don't think the liability is all that great, that a foreign PRO would come into America and go after somebody for doing a worldwide, uh, I haven't seen it happen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you everyone for that. Uh, Liz, go ahead. I'll just um, kind of jump right in. Um, I know that, I mean, obviously many of our viewers are aware of YouTube's content ID system. Um, for those less aware of the other popular streaming platforms, and of course the up and coming streaming platforms, um, is it best practice to assume that other than YouTube, other streaming platforms are going to have a similar type of content ID system in place? You have to ask. Okay. Um, you, you, you can't assume that, no. Okay. I mean, Google prided themselves on spending a hell of a lot of money and time to make that happen, and they're not licensing it to other people as far as I'm personally aware. So, 
Yeah, I think there's a trend towards that that might happen in the future, but um, yeah, as it exists right now, it's it's still very nascent. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and if if you are asking yourself that question, am I going to get caught? You kind of already have your answer that you know you probably need permission. So uh, you know, I would again echo what others have said. Just ask. The other thing you can. Uh, check is make sure that these new services have PRO licenses. It took uh, some of the, uh, it took YouTube and ASCAP and BMI a long time to get to a licensing situation, but now they're in it and it's working reasonably well. Uh, a lot of these services come up and think that it doesn't apply to them. It does. Um, and you'd be best off making sure that they're licensed before you put any content on them. Great. Thank you. In terms of, of streaming violation enforcement, um, is there anything that you can talk to us about? I mean, I know um, many, there have been many instances where a stream has been halted, it's been taken down. Um, what can you share? Are you allowed to share with us about how streaming violations are enforced? Um, Obviously, there are some um, who, who may believe licenses are not necessary because streaming restrictions aren't usually enforced. Those of us that know very much they are enforced um, obviously would argue with them. But what can you say about, about how streaming violations are usually enforced? If you're dealing with ISPs in the US, you're talking about notice and takedown under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, the MPA has a ongoing program where they serve notices of uh, uh, on infringing content. Uh, they serve that on the ISP. It's the ISP's job to notify the posting entity. Uh, if the posting entity believes that they do have the rights, they are allowed to serve a counter notice. Otherwise, the ISP, in order to preserve their safe harbor immunity from prosecution for copyright infringement, will take the, will take the streams down uh, if the counter if the counter notice isn't served or is invalid i'd just like to follow up to that because that is an argument we hear a lot especially from performers like is that oh, i'm just going to put it up and you know if, if it's if, if they take it down they take it down like basically like there's no negative repercussions to me except that the video might be taken down is it is that really the extent of it or could they possibly be liable to some some greater consequences for doing something like that the isp has safe harbor immunity the posters do not Can I hop on my soapbox here too while we're talking about this and and just say it's more than just the the law and and which is important obviously but we're all on the same team here I mean we're all musicians we're all you know the publishers composers librarians orchestras it's important that people are compensated for their intellectual property people are putting hard work into this stuff so you know it's a tight knit community we all have reputations or organizations reputations and it's important we preserve these relationships these are all wonderful people and we work with them regularly. And it's important to, to make sure that people are getting what, what they're owed for their hard work. Yeah, bless you for that. And we all agree on the other way. Can we transition into, uh, we just wanted to give you all an opportunity to maybe uh, um, in, uh, do some visioning or some, I don't know, dreaming. I don't know, maybe that's not the right term here, but um, just kind of looking to the future. Um, with a changing digital landscape, there's more streaming, there's more platforms to stream on, there's way more content online. Many of you have already discussed how you've been adapting to that. Do you see the contract and licensing language, and we're not talking about specifics, this is just a theorizing. Do you see the contract and licensing language evolving um, in the future? And if you if you wanna give more than a yes or no answer. I mean, I, I, I'll jump in and say that, yeah, absolutely, we are seeing, and we're and my colleague Caroline Kane and the, my colleague Doriana Mall in the library, or we've been having con conversations uh, since the beginning of the crisis about, well, how do we get in front of this? And uh, well, we can do that. We can do that by uh, at when uh, uh, organizations are in touch uh, to license uh, music or rent music, we can ask the relevant questions that we're seeing. You know, are you planning to stream this for how long? I mean, this can all be done um, 
in the, on the front end and in a, a, a package kind of way to make it sort of more what Jim was mentioning before, kind of a one stop, um, which I think is helpful. And that's something we want to make it easier. And, you know, the whole idea behind publishing is to, to, to make music available and to make it accessible. And that's exactly uh, what we are talking about is uh, since there is this new paradigm um, and I don't think we're going back, there's, there's, there's definitely going to be a new normal or a better normal uh, where, you know, these digital uh, innovations uh, should become part, I think, of uh, and will become part of most organizations and audiences will start to expect that. And uh, we're there now to, we will be there to work with people on the front end of that. And yes, so the answer to your question is absolutely yes. Yeah, uh, I mean, change is, is inevitable, and it's it's been happening for you know quite quite some time now. I want to look back at uh, at the introduction of ringtones uh, or you know things like that. Uh, I, the, the technology is always changing, um, and of course, in the current the current situation, uh, outside industry uh, forces as well. Um, but you know, I, I think all the publishers are going to respond to the the marketplace and the new environment. Um, that we're in. Uh, so yeah, language, um, you know, and, and fee structures, they, they will change. Um, and hopefully the, uh, the laws will, will catch up or codify that a little more clearly at some point in the future as well. Um, but uh, no, we're always, we're, we're always changing. I would just jump in on that and say that the language will, uh, you know, obviously have to change. And we now have to assume that organizations it'll be a given that there will probably be a streaming component somewhere within their, their rental or with the music itself. So moving forward, yeah, it'll have to be, it's, it's not a new normal now, it, it most likely will be normal. I think the, um, the music industry has adapted. I you know I'm not a 25 year old, so I can tell you I've lived through 45s and eight tracks and you know, cassettes and all of that, okay? And I remember, you know, saying to myself and my colleagues that I don't think there'll be a CD after the year 2000, and there were a couple. So I, I think we will, as a group, as a group of publishers and a group as an industry, continue to adapt, and these things will change. And I think what we like to do is work together in our company, you know, with rental and licensing, you work together to, to see what people want and see what people need. And, and we adapt to what their wants are. If their wants are a, a rental with a stream, with an upload, you know, we all get together and we say to ourselves, this is where we're going. And if we work together, we will get to the point. And, you know, still, I mean, I do have 45s and they are coasters in my house for drinks. So <laughs> I, I think things are still going to be there. I think we're going we're gonna to adapt and, and we'll be better off in the future. Yeah, and I would just pick add to that, Justin, uh, if I may, that, um, you know, in terms of looking forward, I think um, we certainly, I am certainly looking forward to working with my planning partners, planning colleagues at organizations, orchestral administrators and, and administrators at opera companies and at chamber music societies and individual artists themselves in working with them on these, you know, digital enhancements. I mean, helping them make the, you know, working with them to say, provide more information about a new piece or to do a, uh, you know, a live score reading or to do a, um, you know, enhance, uh, enhance information for audiences online or, or composer interviews or more information in that way that will actually make the digital content even more robust. So. Um, that for me is the really interesting and I think intriguing uh, part of where we are in this story. It's all just beginning, so. You know, one, one thing that we're hearing a lot from uh, people who are experiencing this, especially those who are dealing with a lot of music rentals, is, um, you, you know, I was a librarian before this thing called Zinfonia came along. And uh, there's a lot of people who don't remember like before that, right? When we actually had like 12 different forms of 12 different publishers and things like that. And we understand the antitrust situations, which has been you know, brought up and, and, and really made a great point of today and those kinds of things. But you know, this question does linger from the audience. I'm gonna ask two questions here that, to let you all just discuss uh, as we wrap up here. One is, uh, do you desire or do you maybe foresee the, the possibility of a streamlined application process 
uh, that would make it easier for people to request synchronization licenses or any kind of this stuff that comes with streaming. And uh, two, what, what are you looking for from performers? And uh, that includes the organizations or the individuals that would help you all in the future. Uh, well, as I mentioned before, we just recently updated the website. So if you go to the homepage and click under, click the tab orders and requests, there's actually a webcast broadcasting, you know, streaming uh, form that you can fill in with uh, questions asked as to what you're, what you're looking for. So it's actually all there already. And uh, you just need to fill that out. It'll, um, it will uh, transmit directly to my colleague in licensing and uh, she'll get back to you. So actually that in our case is is happening. Yeah, we're constantly trying to make it as easy as possible for, for everyone involved. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of different factors that go into uh, what gets licensed and how it gets licensed. So, um, you know, I don't know if we can find that perfect solution for everyone where it's just an easy, easy thing um, because we have a lot of considerations um, on the back end that, that have been discussed today. So, um, you know, as much as we'd like to make it happen and, and we do try to make it as easy as possible, um, th there are challenges on our end as well. But I think the, yeah, as, as we were talking about before, put, put the questions out there, put out what you want to do, um, as much information as you can. Um, on, at the front end, um, when you are first in touch, as someone else mentioned earlier, um, yeah. put that out there and that will actually streamline and help actually make the process probably more efficient. Um, you know, in my particular instance, I work with some wonderful colleagues who are very responsive and uh, I, I, I would be you know, surprised, you know, that if there were any real lags, I mean, sometimes there might be a lag if there's a originating publisher that hasn't gotten back to us, but, but it, it will happen. And I think, you know, don't be afraid to follow up as well or to speak to someone else in the company. Um, if you know me, drop me a line, you know, I am happy to help. And, you know, sometimes things might get lost, but um, we'll make sure that it's answered and answered quickly. Yeah. And along with that, not just providing as much information as you can, but consider the timeline for doing that. Right. You know, of course, all the publishers are going to try to get back to you as soon as they can. But as others have mentioned, there are a lot of considerations, you know, they might need to get a permission from the composer themselves. They might need to reach out to their originating, originating publisher, you know, so just keep that in mind, you know, I would not recommend contacting a publisher for a stream tomorrow, you know, <laughs> try to give some lead time. Um, and, you know, of course, people are going to try to work with you, uh, but it's it helps everyone uh, all around. Well, I know I can speak on behalf of many of my many, if not all of my colleagues, when I say that we are so grateful for all of the rental librarians we work with at your various companies for fielding our many cumbersome questions, I'm sure, especially <laughs> now during this unprecedented time of, of a lot of stress and anxiety on all of your and our offices. We, we very much appreciate all of the tireless help you've all given us as we all work through this process together. So we're at the end of our, of our time together. So I, I wanted to close by thanking all of you for being panelists, for taking the time to speak with us today. We're so very grateful for your expertise, especially in a world that's changing as quickly as ours. Um, we also wanna thank our webinar production team, everyone managing our social media accounts for their hard work. Um, huge thank you to the Major Orchestra Librarians Association for hosting this event and um, especially the MOLA Board of Directors for making this event possible. Um, I also want to thank those of you in the audience who took the time to join us today. Uh, this webinar will be available for you to view and share on the MOLA YouTube and Facebook pages. If you have any additional questions about anything we've talked about today, please check the MOLA website where you will find many resources, including our US internet streaming fact sheet. Thanks again to everyone for taking the time to join us for this presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now.